In your book, you say that the whole point of technology is to change the human situation. Um, you, you kind of briefly touched on it when you were speaking uh, about uh, being an engineer. So what would, for example, from your, your point of view, be one beneficial change to the human situation that he has not realized yet? And, and how does it relate to, to your work, probably, or to what you do? Hmm. Well, um, there's so many things I could mention. Um, I just turned 51 last week, and I have a lot of friends who are older, and I've been, and also my father, and I've been dealing a whole, whole lot with the effects of aging, and just due to the demographic bulge, there's going to be a massive age wave over many parts of the world. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been thinking a lot about what technologists can do there, because a lot of the difficulties of aging are sort of stupid little practical problems, and uh, it's and some of them might have sort of low tech solutions that await um, discovery, just just the right kind of little crutch or cane or something that could make all the difference. And and once in a while people come up with those, and those are in a way some of the most elegant and admirable kinds of uh, technologists. But there's also a lot of room for sort of high-tech stuff of uh, robotics, exoskeletons, um, all kinds of things like that. And, of course, I'm not the only person interested in that, but I, I think there's a huge opportunity here. Medicine is extending lifespans, but it's not necessarily making those extensions as good as they could be, and there's, there's a big gap to be filled there. And, of course, to the degree people age better, it's also better for those who are younger at the time because then, you know, old people aren't as much of a burden and all um, and they're happier and everybody gets happier <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and and so there's there's just there's just a lot of, of good things there to think about um, I still you know, in, in telecommunications I um, there's, there's been so much attention in the last, oh, I don't know a decade and a half or so on, on uh, kind of um Schemes of just who gets connected to who, you know, like Twitter and f Facebook, and those kinds of schemes aren't. There's some value there, and, and there's some interest, but I'm so much more interested in how people connect, and I'd still like to see like a a really good telepresence system, meaning one in which all the basic human factors are addressed. So, mm -hmm. um, does that impact on on uh, your goals with your own work? Or what oh yeah, you absolutely. Do? Oh hey hey, and, absolutely. And in what I've, way? I've been working on that for decades. I'm 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 uh, very interested in that problem. Is that part of the motivation behind working on virtual reality and so on? Well, I mean, in, not initially. Initially, virtual reality for me was a desire to have the most intense possible experiences um, and to share them with people. That that's. It was a sort of a very useful thing, and that absolutely remains. It was a desire to make dreams become shared and real and intentional and all these things. And I, I, that, that sort of um, perhaps crazy <laughs> motivation is with me to this day, and I, I really still love that stuff. But um, over, I guess in the 90s, I, I really, maybe even in the late 80s, I don't remember, but some, sometime well into the, into the development of virtual reality, I started to really think about just people connecting in a more realistic manner and whether the tools that we associated with virtual reality could help with that. Mm -hmm. And I, I still think that there's a whole, whole lot to be done there. Um, and I've had the good fortune to do a lot of experiments. And uh, while there have been a few disappointments on the whole, I'm, I'm, I'm more enthusiastic than ever that, that, it, that this is a great direction. So, mm -hmm. so what I really want in the future is uh, what, what you could call a sort of a holographic illusion that's one-to-one -one scale and includes all the little subtle uh, subconscious cues between people and would be good enough to, say, play music with somebody at a distance uh, well. And there, there are huge, huge technical barriers that, uh, some of which we've, we've met and others we haven't. It's, it's, a, it's a very non-trivial problem, and it might be the kind of thing that we can't ever quite do well enough, and even the best we can possibly do is still sort of... Um, um, phony in some way, but, you know, I, ha I think we might be able to get somewhere with this that's really good for people. I, I, I want to find out anyway. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, another uh, interesting thing that you say in your book is that, uh, for example, uh, Deep, Bl uh, Deep Blue uh, was a team of people 
not a computer, but, but a team of people coming up with clarity and elegance of thought. And thus it was that team, those people behind Deep Blue, who defeated uh, the world chess champion, Gary Kasparov. Um, what do you think about uh, Watson and his recent win in Jeopardy? And is that different in any way from Deep Blue and Kasparov? Well, I, I have a piece about Watson in the current um, MIT mm -hmm. Tech Review that I can refer you to. And, I mean, you know, I think both of them, they, there was a similarity in that um, there's a kind of a desire by some PR people at IBM to to do a certain kind of spectacle and branding of IBM, um, which is pretty distinct from the work itself. And so I, I always feel a bit awkward here because I, I do think that the public spectacles of these things convey a lot of confused and stupid ideas about science and what people and machines are and all sorts of things and about what was actually done technically. And um, I, I don't necessarily mean to criticize the, 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 the people involved, the, the computer scientists who did this stuff, who are really just working on problems that interest them. So. I, I want to try to um, draw some kind of line and make a distinction between the PR spectacles and the way it's presented to the public and then what was actually done. Um, and uh, I, I, that's often a hard line to draw. Uh, my original um, criticism of uh, the Kasparov game was published in an old IBM magazine, and I, I haven't. I, I, I'm trying to be part of my my um, world of peers rather than be opposed to it. And, so, and it works pretty well, but I, I just really do want to make that clear. So in the case of um, the, uh, the, the Jeopardy contest, I mean, in, in a sense, there, there, a lot of the sort of same fallacies were, were um, brought about, where um, one thing is that you, um, by, by having the software compete with a person, um, a very interesting thing happens, which is it's not it's taken out of the context of other similar software. So instead of the scientific process where you're working within the context of work by peers, you sort of create this theatrical context where you're um, a unique um, sort of mystical phenomenon all by yourself. And that, I, I think that that detracts from progress in technology. So there's there's a sort of an objection there. Um, so just to contrast. Um, when uh, DARPA ran the Grand Challenge for robotic cars, which mm -hmm. I thought was just great, I I loved that, and I was I was um, I was I thought it was, a, was fantastic. What was great about it is that even though you could say, oh well, that's another form of AI, but the thing is, it was presented in a way that that's the way science and technology work, which is with different teams competing against each other, so that the state of the art was relative to the work of people, rather than to sort of some theatrical presentation, which was totally ungrounded. And so uh, um, the other thing about the Grand Challenge is it really spurred on innovation. It really functioned. It, it made b great television, uh, better than the Jeopardy show, in my opinion. And, and you know, that's a, that's a much, much better model. So, so with Jeopardy, first, because of the theatrical thing with the person, you remove yourself from the, the sort of more rigorous technical process that can really help people learn and, and improve. And then, of course, there's all these confusions where, you pretend something done by people is sort of the machine. Um, you also subtly change, you have to change the game a little bit to make the machine be able to win, and that change sort of reduces the human qualities of it. And in the case of Jeopardy, um, I mean, the whole thing about this is that both, both chess and uh, Jeopardy have in common that they're games of nerves, and where you're sort of psyching out your opponents to some degree. Like in Jeopardy, you might try to make an, one of your opponents a little nervous so they screw up or something, and in chess, you're totally playing mind games with the other people. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you go to uh, classic uh, chess games with you know, Bobby Fischer or something, they're all, they're all playing mind games with each other. And the mind games are a really interesting part. And, I think um, Gary Kasparov's nickname was The Beast, actually. <laughs> yeah, sure. And so the thing is that when you, um, you redefine the games, in a way that's like just purely about the information exchange, which is in a way a great shame. So there's a, so there's a sense that humans have reduced themselves by agreeing to redefine the game, to not include all that human stuff, and then um, as far, and then also I mean, 
the um, uh, the thing is that by by creating all this theatrics to make the machines seem like they're sort of getting human, you're actually obscuring the genuine accomplishments of the engineers who built these systems. So, um, on the one hand, I think that the um, I think that the Jeopardy system was kind of um, I think its its function was kind of inflated. Um, I, I think the most interesting critique of it was really the one that uh, Stephen Wolfram did, where he just ran the the set of questions that had come up on the TV shows through Google and Bing just to see um, you know if you just used existing search engines to get the answer with just a, an extra little overlay of uh, filters to sort of pull a likely answer out of search results. And they actually did pretty damn good. I mean, the, the increment wasn't that much. And probably by, you know, probably with just a little bit more of uh, work on the heuristics for applying them in that way, they probably could have done about as well. And so there's this, there's this way in which um, it was just kind of a reframing of a level of performance that we already expect from search engines. And it, I don't know. There's, there was a, there's something. I, I think it was. It, you know, the whole thing was kind of doctored up to create an illusion of a certain kind of capability. But meanwhile, um, the actual work behind these things is quite interesting, and it's not unique to IBM. It's going on at dozens of labs, and communicating the way the algorithms work to the public for real would actually be much more interesting ultimately if it could be done well, and I'm sure it could be. Once again, analogous to what happened with the Grand Challenge with DARPA where you saw people really struggling with different algorithms and different sensor um, methods and all that. Just how do you get these cars to drive themselves? And that stuff was just totally cool and fascinating. And, you know, if instead you'd said, well, we're going to have a self-driving car, you know, race against a race car driver, you know, <laughs> the top the top guy from NASCAR or something, you know, I mean, that could maybe that's what IBM will do next or something. That would be sort of theater, but it wouldn't be science, it wouldn't really be educational, it would be kind of phony, and it would be kind of a waste. And and that, to me, is the big problem with all this AI stuff, is that it creates this sort of phony framework where instead of doing real science and engineering, you get lost in this, this sort of undefinable, like, let's replace people kind of a of a agenda, and it just makes you a bad engineer, because you no longer have a precise definition of what you're going for, because nobody knows what a person is. So, so you're, 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 you know, you become this sort of sloppy. Oh, that's why that's why I call it a religion. It's no longer engineering. 